This episode of The Date Podcast is sponsored by Bopsy. Meet up to six people over mobile video. It's video speed dating. Download Bopsy in the Google Play Store or iTunes. Check out bopsy.com. We know you love us, but the information on our podcast is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. I understand I'm both an LPC and an LMFT. However, this is not intended as a substitute for professional services of any kind. If you or anyone you know needs professional help, please seek mental health services. Hi, everyone. This is Emma. And Zorik. Host of the Date Podcast. And I am so excited to have this beautiful human being on the show tonight. We have Mary Miller. Hello. Who is a licensed marriage family therapist. Nice. Yay! Yay. At LifeWorks. And she works at both the Dallas and Fort Worth office. Yep. Nice. Yes. So... We are going to talk a little bit, um, Mary. What? Ow. What? Why? <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I got trigger happy. Go I can see that. Go Jeez. <laughs> so I'm excited to have Mary's opinion on like the sexual desire and love. So we're going to be talking about an article that um, tells us how our brain reacts. Zorik, how does your brain react? Um, be more specific. <laughs> How does your brain react at any time of the day? <laughs> that is so specific. It just reacts sexually. Like a child? L- like, like a, a child? Like a 14-year-old kid. Like a two-year-old, <laughs> two you mean? Yes, crying yeah. all the time. Jeez. <laughs> Where's your butt? <laughs> <laughs> so <for me>. Stop! <laughs> it started already. It doesn't take much, I can see. <laughs> Okay, Um, so we are available on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, so check us out. If you like what you hear, subscribe, and hopefully leave a review, hopefully a good raving review, right, Emma? Yeah, tell us how funny we are. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes, how funny Emma is. And uh, if you have any questions, which we have been getting a lot of questions lately, uh, send us an email at hello at datepodcast.com or at datepodcast on Instagram and Twitter. So now... Yes. Now for the fun stuff. What do you What do you have, Emma? I have. See, it's serious, right? It's very serious. It's a very serious joke. Okay, tell me. <laughs> no laughing. Okay, a- uh. ask the joke and don't laugh. We cannot laugh. Okay, so we can't look at each other then. No. Okay, so I'm gonna cover my face. Okay. Because I can't okay. do this looking at Zorik. All right. A lawyer is standing in a long line at the box office. Suddenly, he feels a pair of hands kneading his shoulders, back and neck. The lawyer turns around. What the hell do you think you're doing? The other person responds, I'm a chiropractor, and I'm just keeping in practice while I'm waiting in line. And the lawyer responds, well, I'm a lawyer, but you don't see me screwing the guy in front of me, do you? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Emma, you and your joke. That's funny. I thought it was funny. Are you I giggled. Ser- are you searching for more? Or are we? Are we? No, I think I'm done. I'm gonna retire my <laughs> my joke career. That was it, huh? This is the worst. <laughs> the worst. Well. I'm annoyed. Well, tell us about uh, Mary. Oh yes, Mary. Yeah. Mary. Tell yeah. me about me. Tell <laughs> Do it. I met Mary at grad school, actually. Okay. We nope. attended grad That's school right. together at Where? Texas Wesleyan yeah. in Fort Worth. Woo. Yeah. So, what was, what was your first pause? What was your first impression of Emma? Oh my God. The audience wants to hear. Oh my gosh. Um, I hope it was probably it was probably <laughs> negative. Oh my gosh. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Emma likes to talk a lot. <laughs> 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 but actually, what was my observation was that um, in class, everybody was kind of drawn to her because she Aww. was so friendly. I was friendly. And outgoing. I so can be nice. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> when she wants to be. Okay, so you guys met, and then you guys became friends. We fell in love. Oh, oh my we gosh. did. We locked eyes <laughs> oh right. in one of our classes, uh-huh. one of our marriage and family therapy mm-hmm. classes, I'm sure. Uh-huh. And then... It was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Right. And well, and 
Emma and I went on a study abroad trip together. So yes. Actually, that's where we really got to know each other. Yeah, in bit. London. Yeah, we yeah. went to London together mm-hmm. to learn really important therapy stuff. Really stuff, good. huh? Like, yeah. so yes. what was it for? Was it for class? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was, for it class. was like paid by the sc- paid for by the school. Kind or? of paid for by the students of yeah. the school <laughs> at a at a good at a good rate. At good a very good rate. rate. Yeah. yeah, it was a good travel rate. That's of course, great. we were sitting in the back of the back of the plane, but uh-huh. it was a good rate. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, I slept a lot on that plane ride. Okay. Well, what did you learn? Like in that, what well, was like the main takeaways fr- from that trip? What were we? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, well. Didn't we learn that, well like... Was our, don't you remember that was our group therapy course? Yes. <laughs> but um, really, we were there to study a specific type of therapy called brief therapy. Yes. And um, But both narrative and solution-focused. Yeah. So it, it's yeah, probably not important to to other people. It was I, very interesting to us. Yeah, I do remember that one of the activities that's coming up to my brain now was that we had to write 10 things that we liked about ourselves. I don't remember that. Yeah, I remember because I didn't write 10. I wrote 100 things that I liked about myself. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I believe it. It was like me, <laughs> me, me, Emma Panetta, me. It got difficult around like 80 something because I was like, I'm like running stuff that I can talk about. But I'm like, no, I will get to 100. Right. Yeah. I'm, my, my memories are more about what we did when we were in class. Oh, my so. gosh, for sure. <laughs> it yeah. was fun. That was, yeah. yeah, that was a nice trip because we got out of class really early mm-hmm. and could go have fun Yeah, we'd go on the right side of London. the bridge. It was fun. Nice, mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. So let's, let's go back. Mary. Yes. Yeah. Where are back. you from? So I'm from a town called Chico, not Chico, Texas, Chico, California, which mm-hmm. is north of Sacramento. So it's a little town oh, about the size of Denton. And actually, um, it reminds me of Denton a lot because it has a university, like Denton has a couple oh. universities. And, but it's a small town. Um, and so the, I think the main draw for a lot of people is the university, and then a lot of people end up staying in the town after they graduate. Okay. So yeah, little bitty town. I have five brothers. Wow. Oh, a lot of brothers. And I'm the only girl. Where are you in the mix? I am um, number four. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. yeah number huh. four. So lots of testosterone in my life, which actually <laughs> has been helpful for me as a therapist because I feel like I can relate well to both males and females pretty easily. Yeah. yeah. I bet there was a lot of chaos too at home. Like you were probably the referee. No. Like, no. <laughs> Mary's like I was causing no. the trouble. I mean, no, I was um and the house I grew up in is pretty traditional. So the girl, I would say girls, but there was only one of me did the girl things uh-huh. and then the boys did the boy things. So So you could yeah. like doing like all the indoor chores. Yes. Yeah. And the boys did the we lived on a five acre walnut orchard. So the boys did more outdoor things and the girl. Well, I, my brothers helped inside too, some, but I shouldn't say that they only did outdoor stuff. But yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah, so so high school there too. And I went, yeah, I actually. Uh, so I've only been in Texas for it's ten years this past June. Oh wow! So I w- grew up and stayed in that town. Um, mm-hmm. Raised my kids in that town, and then um, my my husband now lived in Texas, and I wanted to go back to school, so. He said, you should go back to school in Texas. <laughs> he whisked you away, didn't he, he? He whisked me away, yes. Yeah, and I can't believe I haven't asked Emma this question, but right. when did you know you wanted to, be, wanted to be a therapist? Like, was it young when you were a kid? Yeah, I felt like it was a very, like, I kind of knew in high school that I wanted to go to, sc- like, uh, undergrad and grad school to be a therapist. Was it because people were, like, you know, asking for your advice or something? Or no, you just for me, it, it was a very much, it was, like, more, like, I'm a first-generation American, right? Because I come from, you know, immigrant parents. And so, for me, it was more of how can I teach other parents to validate their children? Because during the struggle of... I'm Salvadorian, but I'm also American, and I'm trying to find this balance in both cultures, and, like, I don't want to feel like I'm alienating one over the other, and so for me, it was more of, like, how can I help others be able to find that balance and validate them and then teach the parents that just because they're not embracing the cultures at this moment doesn't mean that they won't in the future. Gotcha. So, So Mary, did you know early on as well? No. um, I, I had... 
had experiences with therapy, um, but I really didn't know until, um, so my background is in the corporate world and I worked for um, a Fortune 40 company, an insurance company, and I was a business manager and worked in a call center. And so part of my job, I had a lot of uh, people reporting to me. I think I had, oh, like uh, about 100 to 150, it varied, mm -hmm. um, indirect reports and then about six direct reports. And I found that most of the day I was attending to people's um, needs on a personal level. And mm -hmm. um, so I, and I felt like I was kind of good at it. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, um, and then I had ex a really positive experience with therapy. I went through a divorce and I went into, I was in therapy during that experience. And um, I found it incredibly beneficial and um, gave me a lot of insight into myself. And I wanted to kind of, um, I guess, share that with other people. Yeah. yeah. So this is like a, a career change. So you're, yeah. you're, you're yeah. basically saying so. Yeah. So I'd, I actually had to start like all over. I went um, to undergraduate and then graduate school. So, yeah, it was a huge shift for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, because you go from one extreme to the other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It was. But I, I am so grateful that I made that change and had the opportunity to because um, it's been life-changing for me, really. It's been great. Yeah, so you, yeah. are you married or do you have kids? or? So I am married, um, and I have um, two daughters from mm -hmm. my first marriage. My oldest daughter is... Dun, dun, dun. She just turned 30. Oh. And, um, I know. <laughs> We're like right? the same age. I didn't realize. Yeah. Don't I didn't I realize. Look good, huh? Yeah, you do. <laughs> I kept thinking they were like in their like mid young 20s. No, they're, they're, they're older. They're adults. Uh -huh. um, and she lives in Seattle. And then my youngest daughter is 28 and she lives in Denton. Okay. So, how did you? So, we talk a lot about, Emma and I talk about mm -hmm. apps. We talk about meeting people yeah. and dating. How did you meet your husband? At, I think how a lot of people <laughs> do at work. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So I met my husband. He was um, he's a technology consultant, and the company I worked for had just acquired another company, and I was put on this project to help integrate the two call centers. Wait a second, you guys were at work. We were at work. <laughs> we met at work. <laughs> and the thing that stood out to me, so he came, and it was. January 2nd, 2006. I remember. Oh. oh. I, remember I hope he remembers. <laughs> he, I think he does. <laughs> I remember. And I remember I, we, I knew I had some people coming in to, you know, from the outside that we had to get set up in an office and stuff. And I was like super annoyed. I was like, oh, I don't want to deal with people. I mean, it's January 2nd. So right. it's a holiday weekend. And um, so I usually would have the administrative secretary like attend to them once I introduced myself, but I introduced myself to him and I liked him right away. What was it? like? Because oh, we talk about, like last episode, right? Uh -huh. About it takes 100 milliseconds for a person to like judge attractiveness uh -huh. and judge someone's like, what is it? They're, how they are as a person? Yeah. So was it like an yeah. instantaneous, like I like him or was it something? I'm like just really like yeah. enjoying this story right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I liked him and he, so he came and he had had a long trip to get to where our office was because it's kind of far from an airport but anyway his luggage had gotten lost oh, okay. and so he didn't have like his business attire and he showed up you know what whatever he had on the plane and he looked so nice uh -huh. and I was like I like a guy who looks nice uh -huh. on the plane and and then he had such a good sense of humor about the luggage being lost and I, and then there was just like, I don't know, there's something about Phil. It, it, he has an energy that's just very calming. Yes. Yeah. See? Yes. You know, yes. Been around him. Uh huh. Um, and in the business world, like, you just don't get that a lot. Mm -hmm. So I just instantly liked him. And so I did something really out of character for me. I gave him like an, a tour of the entire office. Oh, oh man, that's how you knew she liked mm -hmm. him. And I was like, this She's is like, the break room. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, is where, where we I make coffee. <laughs> and then in every meeting, I was like, I just, I, I liked him. And then we went to dinner that same well, week. Okay. How did that happen though? Was it um, just you two? No. So, okay. it, you know, <laughs> when you have 
people from other offices coming into your office, you have to do the after office dinner. Yeah. You know, thing which is such a drag typically. Like mm-hmm. who wants to go make small talk with people after you've worked all day? Nobody. Not right. me. Yeah. So um but I actually wanted to go. And um so we went and he and I ended up seated next to each other. Which did she do that way, on purpose? I looked good that night. <laughs> <laughs> I just want the record to show. Why, why did you look good? Is it was well, there a purpose you know, there? I was younger and I used to, I you know it's when I wore always wore really high heels to work. But anyway, mm-hmm. I just I I just I I don't know. You know how you know when you look good? It was one yes. of those nights. I just was like I was feeling it. Uh-huh. Look good. And um, you're I, like estrogen was like yeah. on point. <laughs> what? Yeah. Red and, lipstick. And I was I went we went to dinner and he and I sat and talked and it was like I the whole rest of the restaurant and everybody else at the table fell away and it was like he and oh I were just having this conversation oh that's, that's so beautiful. romantic it was, yeah. it was and then I was like oh I really like him so this is kind of funny we were because he and I were just talking about this last night <laughs> so I knew he would never ask me out um, because you know he's a consultant and I'm the customer and I just knew like and I, I'm young. I'm quite. That's a, a no-no, also. Yeah. Business world. And I'm kind of. I'm a bit younger than he is. Um, a bit taller too. Um, and I just was like, he's never. He's <laughs> never gonna ask me out. So, I made a point of driving him to the airport. Oh <laughs> which my! Is really oh. I, do either. <laughs> oh. I was like, I'll take you to the airport. It's right by my house. And um, so I, I got his card, and it had his. Um, I think it had his home phone number on it because I think he, you know, he's a independent, so I think Works he from was home working a lot. from home. Yeah. yeah. So I, after he left and I knew he was on the plane, I called and left a voicemail and said, "Hi, this is Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to let you know I really enjoyed having you here, and I'd love to hear from you sometime." And um, he had like ended up flying all night and getting stuck in Los Angeles or something, but he called me. Uh, well, he told me last night he got that voicemail at like 5 a.m. when he got in. Jeez. And he was like, when am I going to call her? When am I going to call her? Oh. And he called me um, <laughs> the next morning. And yeah, groovy. Nice. So, yeah. And now you guys are married. Yeah. Now, and we got married um, the same year we met. We got engaged in like five months and married. Which, by the way, I would never recommend. It. <laughs> <laughs> but it was perfectly fine for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it works out Hey, sometimes. like yeah. we always say, yeah. like, you know. Do as we say, not, not as, as we, we do. do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we got your story. Thanks. So yes. so where Thanks. where does that uh, connection? So what so what therapy do you do? So I am a primarily a couples therapist um, and also a sex therapist, and so I work um, with a wide range of couples issues. Um, I I ha- work with a lot of couples experiencing infidelity in the relationships, and then um, of course I do sex therapy, mm-hmm. and I, I also see individuals. So a lot of um, clients will come to me individually um, in dealing with sexual issues. I I would say half the clients I get actually come individually. Gotcha. So Mary, tell us a little bit because I'm sure our um, listeners, you know, probably have an idea of what sex therapy is. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so maybe we can debunk a little bit of that. So what is sex therapy? So it's a good question. (laughs) Um, Sex therapy, so a lot of sexual issues can be attended to by any therapist, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And, but sex therapy, typically a sex therapist is somebody who's had a little more um, training and spent more time in training, and they're working with issues that maybe are around more dysfunction, um, so um, erectile dysfunction mm-hmm. or any kind of painful um, sex, um, or real problems with libido. Um, so anything that re- requires maybe a little more specialty or specialized training. Mm-hmm. Um, what it is not. <laughs> Tell <laughs> me. Is, what Tell us. Not is like like I think people when they come in sometimes they're wanting me to give them like tips and tricks. Right. And maybe I'm going to show them like you know some maneuvers. So there's no like visual. <laughs> no. There's no like no. you bring two people in and you tell no. them hey do this position. No. Not not in the way that I work. Um, you know there is um, and I'm sure your listeners maybe have heard of sexual surrogacy. Um, so there are people who may. 
um, function and more of that role, but that's not the role that um, a sex therapist is going to play. You might find that more in California, the sexual surrogacy. You might be surprised. Oh, there's some here? Oh, there's there, there are some in Texas. Yeah. There are some in yeah. Texas, yeah. but the rules yeah. in California right. are a lot more right. lenient than yes. they are here in Texas. That's true. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is true. So, so that surrogacy, it's like do this position versus that position. It'll pleasure um, him more this way or that way? or. Um, n- no, not necessarily, but it is somebody who's more hands-on. So, um, uh, for example, if somebody... You know, sometimes some adults have never had a sexual encounter and maybe their own fear about the fact that they've never had a sexual encounter is inhibiting them to even have a sexual Mm -hmm. encounter. So uh, uh, one role a sexual surrogate might play is that they um, help the client become more comfortable with touch and partnered touch. Um, So... You know, there's a. L- I know within the therapy world, there's co- some controversy around yes. the appropriateness of that, and I, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Because we can be here for like another hour. That's not what I do. Okay. Right. Yeah. So just so we're clear, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So what are what are just the common things people ask you, like clients ask you? Um. You know, honestly, I I think I can sum it up to one question, which is basically, am I normal? Am I normal? Am I normal? Is in what regard? Like sexually? W- like physically? Yes. Yeah, all. All. Really? So like, is what I'm experiencing as a sexual adult um, appropriate and is it normal? Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say, and even with couples, you know, um, so when you have couples that come in, um, even sometimes couples are wondering, you know, my partner likes this and I don't. Is that normal? Yeah. Um, so really, at the core of most most questions, that question is sort of um, at the base of it. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, because the, I think that even though we are becoming a little bit more liberal sexually, I think I can mm-hmm. say that. I mean, mm-hmm. we are becoming a little bit more liberal mm-hmm. sexually. There are still these misconceptions of like, what is okay um, if you're in a relationship or outside of a relationship, right? And if you are in a relationship, like we are in Texas, we are in the Bible Belt. Um, I ha- I know plenty of people um, that whenever, so I kind of started my training, but I never finished it. Mary is doing a, a much better job than me about that. <laughs> um, the, the, the misconception was, but sex is only to reproduce. And I'm like, no, sex is pleasurable. And when you have, like, you can make that more of an experience and it doesn't have to be scary and it doesn't have to feel robotic either but you need to be able to have that conversation with your partner and like what your wants and desires are and not be afraid that you're going to be um looked down upon by your partner mm-hmm. or judged by your partner and i think that's a big one is the the fear of the judgment right, right. um and so a lot of for me you know it's you were you're also working with a couple about like how to work through that judgment too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in therapy, you know, people, um, so all of us get some sort of education about sex and, um, (laughs) like when you, and for people listening, you know, just think about the first time you were educated about sex. Uh Sometimes it comes from the family. Sometimes it comes from friends, peers. Sometimes it comes from television. (laughs) Sometimes it comes from adult, Videos. Yes, adult <laughs> videos. Yeah. You know, so like we get all these messages about sex that um, we sort of carry and inform us about um, our own sexuality. And so a lot of times in therapy, we're really trying to just sort of unpack what was the message you got mm-hmm. and what is it that you took from that and what is it and, and how has that affected you as a sexual person and what is the message you actually would like to have for your for your sexuality or your sex right. life. Yeah. And so it's kind of separating those things out and kind of um, helping the person sort of um, define and explore their own sexuality. Right. Yeah. Because those messages that you receive as a child like really do impact your sexuality as you're a grown up, like your sexual life. Because if you're told like we're in the Bible Belt, so if we're told that we're only supposed to have sex to procreate, right, to have children and we're having sex out of wedlock, mm-hmm. like 
like one, you know, you might find a woman that can't find that pleasurable because I'm not supposed to have pleasure from this because I'm only supposed to have sex in a relationship when I'm married. Or if they masturbate, I have to make sure that I orgasm quickly um, because if I linger too long, it's not appropriate. I can't use my hand if I masturbate. I can only use a vibrator. And so there's like all these rules that we create in our head um, that we are very unaware of. And so when you unpack it, like Mary said, it allows you to see, oh, how true is this really? Oh, why, why, you know, where did this thought come from? Mm -hmm. And then you're able to sort of let go of those things through the work, through time. Right. Or, or you may say, oh, but I, I actually like that idea or I like that value right. that I was given and I'm going to keep it. So it's, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, it's about really helping the client um, figure out, figure it out for themselves. Yeah. So I think 90% of our listeners are single mm -hmm. and dating. Do you have a lot of clients that are single and dating? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. Uh, and, and so it's interesting. It depends on the kind of where they are, um, generationally. Cause I have clients of all ages. Um, but um, it's funny when I when clients are dating, sometimes they're trying to check me out to see what I think about sex and dating. <laughs> like if yes. I think it's okay, yeah. so they'll kind of like give me a little piece of information, and I'm like, uh huh, and then they'll, and they'll like test me to see my reaction, and then they'll give me a little more and a little more and a little more, and I, yeah. So yes, I do. It, yeah, and so I think Emma was talking about um, um, it being sexually liberal now. Mm -hmm. um, how? I feel more sexually more liberal. Sex I, mean, I don't think we're completely, yeah. well, we are more. It's a real contradiction, <laughs> I think, for us as a culture because we have a lot of sexual messages mm -hmm. um, in media, but I think um, the way we are socialized is still fairly conservative. Right. So we're given, you know, um, images a lot and a content, a lot of sexual content, but then our parents sort of give us the same party line which is if you do it you'll die <laughs> so yeah right yeah. you do that you might die <laughs> so, yeah. so we have yeah, our cake but we just can't eat it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so when it comes to sex though i do you do you see sex on the first date being more socially acceptable i it really i know this is gonna annoy people because all therapists say this it depends uh -huh. um <laughs> so what i prefer to do is help the client explain Explore their values around what's appropriate for them because I think there are adults who can be sexual right away and be comfortable with that and I think there are adults who when they're sexual right away they have very mixed feelings about it and so for me it's more about not what I think is right or wrong or good or bad it's about what is best for this person in front of me and how can I help them make that decision for themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and feel really good and confident about that decision, no matter what it is. Yeah, I like your answer better because there's a lot of statistics that Emma and I read that say, you know, it's okay to have sex on by the third date or the sixth date, mm -hmm. but then you're saying that it depends on the person. It which depends is, on yeah. the yeah. person, yeah. I, I think, um, and I mean, and that can change um, throughout a person's lifetime. So, um, you know, what may, what somebody may have been really comfortable with in their twenties, in their thirties, they may say, you know, I'm not sure that that still works for me. Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, these, our values are evolving as we grow and as we have experiences and as we gain, um, wisdom. Right. And so again, in that moment, you know, I'm, I want to be with the client where they are and, ex and help them kind of explore what's true for them. Yeah, for sure. And values do change over the lifetime. They're not yeah. going to be the same, yeah. right? Um, they're going to be some that you might just gravitate to just more naturally, just because maybe this is more of like a core value versus maybe one of your, um, sub values. Right, yeah. Right. Um, I do want to talk about how you work with infidelity. Mm -hmm. Um, cause we've spoken about, um, Esther Perel in the past. Yes. And my, so my hero. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So she's great. There, we have Mary and I both have a connection to Esther Perel. Yeah. Yeah. So she's like a celebrity and oh my gosh. Yes. Are she's, you kidding me? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> she's like, like the rock star. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Oh, for sure. I love hearing her speak. I do too. Yeah. Well, what is she like? That doctor, Doctor Sue, or who's that? Doctor Ruth. Ruth. Yeah. Is she like her? She's. She, I guess for for Doctor Ruth's day. Perhaps. Yeah. 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 Is she yeah. like holding dildos and showing them? You know, like they uh, honestly, <laughs> no. She's, I, what I th- appreciate about Esther is that um, she is like it, what she's doing is she's inspiring thought and conversation. Right. Mm-hmm. So okay. she's not handing anyone an ideology. Okay. She's I- inspiring people to think about um, things in maybe different ways. And she's right there with you as you're doing Mm -hmm. it. Like she's doing the same thing, which is so, uh, I think, exciting for me as a therapist. Right. And um, I hope for the people that she's that she's connecting with. Like how. So for me, obviously, like infidelity is one of those things that, you know, when I first started being a therapist, I knew that that was going to be one of the things that I struggled with the most when I had a couple that one of them, you know, had cheated on the other person. That was going to be a struggle for me because it, it's it's the break of, of the contract, right? It's the break of the trust. It's the relationship. And so as a therapist, you have to be able to set yourself apart from that and remember that it's not about you, that it's about the people in front of you. And so this last time that I heard Esther speak, she spoke about infidelity in such a beautiful way that I was just so taken aback by it and I felt like wow like this is just amazing and beautiful and you're you're helping me just become a a better therapist right right yeah I I mean unfortunately in this job you know we meet people Mm -hmm. when they're at the most difficult points in their life right and and working with couples certainly working with infidelity is one of those times and um I I haven't. Oh, I, so I feel lucky because I've never had the judgment connected to it. Like mm-hmm. I always am more curious about um, why it's showing up in a couple's relationship at this time, or even for the person that um, I guess we'll call the perpetrator. Yes, <laughs> that mm-hmm. feels wrong, but we'll just use that terminology. Um, or so, the uh, yeah, I'm trying yeah. to think of the. And, and it's hard. Another it's term. Like for, I have compassion for a lot, oftentimes for both sides because it's really unusual to get a, a client. I mean, frankly, somebody who's going to be a serial um, cheater that doesn't really care about their partner probably mm-hmm. isn't coming into therapy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Doubt it. Um, so, you know, usually when I'm meeting the couple, both of them are in a lot of agony. Right. Um, the perpetrator because of all the guilt and um, the victim, I hate that terminology, but um, the, the victim because of the pain that they're, they're going through. So mm-hmm. um, in those early sessions, you know, really it's trying to um, support both parties right. and just help them find some stability in the midst of a total crisis, which right. is so difficult. And mm-hmm. again, I have a lot of compassion for that. So yeah. can you come back from that? Yes, you can. And um, I so I I too am like I'm an Esther Perel fanatic. So I've (laughs) seen her several times and I've been really lucky to have experienced some of her trainings around infidelity. And of course, she has a book called The State of Affairs. If you Mm -hmm. if you need this book, go buy it. Um, But one of the things she talks about is how for the couple um, that it's this aspect of um, you, you're going to be creating something new. So maybe you're mm-hmm. saying goodbye to the relationship you had and um, and then trying to see if there's the capacity to create something new and a new, a, a better, hopefully a better relationship for both parties. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's say it didn't work out and they ended up, you know, breaking up mm-hmm. or divorcing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, how does someone, I guess, go into a new relationship knowing that that happened in the past? How do they get over that? Ah, this is, I, you know, so may, uh, probably different therapists have different responses to this. Um, uh, to me, this is kind of like an existential <laughs> question <laughs> because what, what happens is you don't trust yourself anymore, mm-hmm. right? You don't mm-hmm. trust your judgment, your ability to discern whether somebody's, you know, Uh, just totally lying to you or not and I think the way that I kind of talk through that with with um, clients is um, 
one, like, do they pay attention to their intuitive selves? Like, because a lot of times people will kind of know something's happening, but they don't want to know it until they're like really ready right. to know it. Um, and for those of you who've had that experience, I'm sure you can look back and have identified some things along the way that you just were like, no, I don't want to see that. But anyway, the, the question I like to ask clients, and believe it or not, I got this from Dr. Phil. <laughs> 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 Dr. Phil McGraw. I'm not like, I, I find Dr. Phil entertainment, entertainment. <laughs> but he said something one time, like probably 20 years ago on Oprah. He actually used to be a licensed <laughs> clinician. He's, He's not anymore, though. <laughs> he, had, he had this couple. On, remember when Oprah used to have like couples? And yes. Couple? So he was on there and he asked, this a woman asked the same question like how do I know how do I know he's not going to do it again or how do I know I can trust him again and I think this question is for the relationship she was in or even if she moved on and he said do you trust yourself to be okay if it happens again Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the way I approach it is like do you trust yourself to be okay if you have this kind of relationship again and if the answer is no then that's where we start to work if the answer is no, I don't trust myself to be okay. Like if this happens to me ever again, I'm going to totally fall apart. So then we start to work on that and work on what it's like to live in a world that you Mm -hmm. can't control. And there's a lot of unknowns and, and how do we, um, yeah. How do we build the person's, um, ability to kind of with withstand that kind of stuff? Yeah. So then it becomes more of kind of the individual work. Right. Mm -hmm. So it fluctuates. Like, I mean, therapy, just uh, any kind of therapy just fluctuates between like, if you're there for family or couple or individual can become, you know, individual, couple, family or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of like meeting where the meeting the client where they need like where where they need you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so um, I guess I guess if someone did have a past like that, it'd be mm-hmm. difficult for them to, to date nowadays because everyone's dating multiple people mm-hmm. and everyone's <laughs> I don't know if everyone's sleeping with multiple people, but. Um, what's your recommendation for people who are dating and sleeping with multiple people? Do you recommend that or not recommend that? I don't recommend anything. <laughs> 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 so what, uh, so I, okay, so I'm going to answer the question this way because I think it will answer the other question you asked about sex on the first date. Yeah, yeah. So there's this brilliant guy that actually Em and I both had training with. His name is Doug Braun Harvey. Oh my gosh, he is amazing. amazing. So he's a therapist um, from San Diego. Mm -hmm. And actually he treats what's called out of control sexual behavior. Oh my gosh, what is that? Um, What is that though? It's, so Um, the the lay culture, I guess would call it like sex addiction. Oh, yes. But um, anyway, he came up with these six sex principles. Say that. Five times, really fast. Six sex principles, six sex principles, six sex principles, six sex principles. No, that's it. (laughs) (laughs) So, um... I, so when I'm, I'm working mad. with a client, I, I start with those. And the first one, of course, is consent. You know, do you have consent to be sexual? Yeah. Um, consent. Love it, use it, know it. Right. <laughs> consent. Um, and then the second one... So is, it, what is, is that asking or... Let's say like, I mean, I'm in a room together. Let's and I'm say. Like, I'm like Emma. Let's say. And you have a you have a third party watching. Oh, third party. Like well, a I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. And I'm like Emma. Shall we? Is that is it the question or um, or is it a feeling because? My answer yeah. would be no. Oh. Okay. I think I you know. I <laughs> recommend you get some clarity. So you know how you know how when you um. You get on a plane. Do you ever sit in the exit row? Sometimes. No. Okay. No, because no. I don't want that responsibility. Begrudgingly. <laughs> so when you sit in the exit row, what's supposed to happen, it doesn't always happen, but what's supposed to happen is that the flight attendant comes up to you and asks each person okay. individually if they are prepared for the responsibility of sitting in that row. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. And the person needs to not just nod, they need to say yes. <laughs> So we know you're celibate, Emma. Is that what you do? Do you ask the guy, or would you ask the guy? I w- ask the guy what? I would. I would like to kiss you and have sex with you. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I don't <laughs> ask for consent when I'm kissing. Uh-huh. Um, I do say. I won't say it on the first date, but I like maybe the second or third. I'll be like, I am celibate, so uh-huh. don't expect anything on the from second me. Or third date. 
Sometimes. Sometimes it'll take a little longer because I'm trying to build the trust and I'm trying to make sure they like me for me before I drop like this bomb because that's a deal breaker. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mary doesn't agree no with judgment. me. No, I'm joking. No judgment. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, d- I recommend people get consent. But, yes. but the second thing we talk about is um, protection. Oh. So yes. What does that mean? In what ways? Like a helmet? Um, yeah. I yes, wear a you condom. Need a bodysuit? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Full latex bodysuit. Oh, okay. Protect, no. Dental uh, dam? Yeah. So using condoms, I mean, okay. they are very helpful. <laughs> and you can just go to, like, several hospitals. They have, like, um, you know, they have clinics. I have a friend who works for, oh, my gosh, what does she work for? She Oprah. works for Texas Health Resources. That's all I know. Yeah. And she always has condoms to give out. So, yeah, okay. there, there's kind of like no excuse. Yeah. <laughs> so number two They're is wear a condom. Accessible. Yeah, number two is wear a condom. Um, is the sexual experience non-exploitive? In mm-hmm. other words, um, are you, if you know the partner you're with is really wanting long-term relationship and you're just in it for a groovy, quick hookup. Yeah. Um, are you just taking advantage of that person's desire for a long-term relationship oh, so they may deep. be more? Yeah. Or are you being, um, you know, are you exploiting them in any way? And and exploitation looks a lot of different ways. Exploitation right. is about power. So right. are you using your power and knowledge is power, uh, money is power, like physical size? Is there anything exploitive going on? So this is a decision tree. If there's a no, mm-hmm. that means right. bail. Basically, right. right? Is that what you're saying? Right. And and so I want to finish because I... Yeah, finish, the, please. Um, honesty. So being honest, like Emma, you just talked about being honest mm-hmm. about celibacy. So being honest about what it is you're looking for in the relationship, including the sexual relationship, mm-hmm. is important. Um, shared values. Do you guys have this... At Once you share, do you do they respect your values? Right. And do you have similar values around what that sexual encounter is going to be? Um for ex- and I think this would come up most often as like this is a hookup for me. Is this a hookup for you? And like kind of getting a sense. That's of that. not sexy though. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know. Right. Well, and nobody wants to have that conversation yeah. <laughs> either. Right. Like, is this just like a one and done thing, or is this going to happen multiple I'd be like, times? Yeah. Emma, are our values aligned <laughs> at this moment? <laughs> no. Please leave my house. Oh my gosh. This isn't for you. Send it. <laughs> okay. Go. Ahead. And then um, pleasure. So yes. the sexual encounter, is the sexual encounter pleasurable? Mm-hmm. So those are the six. After or before? During? It's up to them okay. to decide. <laughs> it's up to them to decide. So that's kind of like when I have a client who's um, kind of, I guess, considering or wanting to talk about when is it okay to be sexual? Should they be sexual? And uh, how sexual or whatever. Those are the those are the questions I encourage them to ask of themselves and kind of come up with the answers themselves. Yeah, yeah. Because um, hook the hookup culture is big. Uh, Emma mm-hmm. and I talk about that a lot. It's not that new, you guys. I it's hate not. To tell you that. No, I'm. I I'm no, I'm I think older. it's just a little <laughs> bit. I think because we have technology, and I think because we yeah, are. It's just easier to facilitate. Yeah. You don't yeah, have yeah. to actually like, get dressed up and go down to the bar and buy the drinks you can find out in advance yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm guessing if if you answer yes to all these questions i bet th- the experience is much better the sexual experience well that's that is the hope yeah that's, <laughs> that is that's the, the hope. hope and it's sh- the sexual experience should last how long is there any like there's <laughs> no right or there's wrong. no right or i was gonna say <laughs> yeah. i don't know the answer to that question no it just how depends right or wrong i mean i know i'm okay so this will probably date me there's, um, which you know who George Clinton is? Yeah. The P-Funk. Wait. He's it? a singer, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he yeah. wrote a song way back when called All She Wanted oh. Was a Quickie. Oh. So I don't know. Maybe sometimes. So it depends on the so person, right? It depends right? on the person. Yeah. So I think it depends. I got So do you get all these questions like, you know, how long am I not lasting long enough? Or oh, yeah. How is, yeah. is my libido For sure. good enough? Or For sure. And like, I, I, and uh, I understand the the desire to know the answer to the question and i think it's because you know our frame of reference is so limited so i only know um i can't my my base for what's normal and i'm using air quotes i Mm -hmm. I realize nobody can see me yes Um, she really is is. based on what my friends may have told me and 
uh, you know, people don't always tell the truth. And what I've observed on a lot of times, um, like uh, sexually with sexually explicit material. So, like a lot of people don't have a good base for um, what what normal again air quotes is. And to me, it's like it doesn't matter. It's what your what what does your partner think? Mm -hmm. does your, yeah. If your partner thinks you're not, it's not long enough, then maybe. And I was talking about the time. Um, maybe <laughs> maybe then you should have a conversation about what it is they're looking for and you know and yeah and go that's from there and that's a hard uh, topic to broach during sex like right communicating what I like or what I don't like because people do can't like your partner can get defensive as yeah. you're bringing these things up well there are ways to talk about it well so how, how would that so I think for most of us you're right so when when we're having sex we also have the typically the added benefit of not having our clothes on. So we're feeling a little exposed. Mm, very. Right? <laughs> so that's, that is, you can frame things in, I think, in a positive way that help people feel affirmed. So by saying what you actually like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I really like it when you do X. I really like it when you do Y. Why don't we try Z? Mm -hmm. Instead of, you're doing it wrong. Oh. Or the, or I think, you know, the shoulder tap. Nobody wants the shoulder tap or the head tap, right? <laughs> like, that's not going well. Like, so. What is she referring to? I was like, wait, what is she referring to? And you it know. took me a little bit to like realize. That okay. That was, was in Seinfeld. Anyway. Yeah. I didn't watch that show. <laughs> I know, I'm older. Um, so, yeah, Zora, you watched it, right? A little bit. Okay. Yeah. There's ways you can, you can um, communicate that don't have to be critical yeah. to mm -hmm. a person to let them know what you're into. Yeah, if it's critical, like the boner is gone. Yep. Right, Emma. Well, and I would say for yes, females, my boner's like, gone. you know, the <laughs> legs are crossed. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's one big thing. It's it's very difficult to even ask that first question. But I guess if you get that out of the way in the beginning, you'll have better sex. What, what first question? Well, I mean, just any question about how someone likes yeah. a certain thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the yeah. first question you should be asking is consent. Yes. Can we do this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or is, I, and I, I mean, I, I think there's ways to do that too that don't take away from the experience. Like, do you like this? Is it all right if I do that? And actually that can be quite sexy. Right? Yeah. You know? Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Emma? Yes, right? Mary. Right, Emma? Yes, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> do you have anything to say do about that? Do you like it like that? <laughs> do you like it like this? <laughs> Emma. Oh my God, no, Zorik! I'm kidding. I'm this kidding. is like strike three, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so we we had some questions from people too. A lot of okay. questions. Um, they're they're random though. Okay. And I kind of just I went through a couple of them. Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh my gosh! I don't want to. Why? Hmm. Okay. So let's say someone's had sex with a new partner. Uh huh. Let's say how long? Let's how long? Who is this? Someone Zorik? Um, I think it's Zorik. Donald Duck. <laughs> <laughs> how long should you wait until you fall asleep? Like during sex? After sex? <laughs> oh. Hmm. So. I don't know. I, that's a, 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 like I guess that. Okay. So let me answer it this way. <laughs> <laughs> let me answer it like this. When you think about sex, and by the way, this is not my own idea. So I, Marty Klein is a sex therapist in Palo Alto, California, and I heard him talk about sex in this way, and I thought it was very helpful. So when it comes to the sexual encounter, it's really about preference. Yeah. And um, so the way he framed it was like this. And actually, I'll do this with you guys, if you guys don't mind. You okay. play along? Yeah, okay. I'll play along. So Emma, when you go out to a restaurant, what kind of restaurant do you like to go to? Oh, it just depends on my mood. But typically, I like to have like probably like a good steak and a good wine. So maybe like a steakhouse. Okay. Do you li so you like a tablecloth, you know, linen napkin kind of place, or yes. is it just okay? And do you like full bar or just wine and beer? I like a full bar. Okay, full bar. And so you want a waiter? You don't care. You want a waiter. She wants a waiter. Look, look, look yeah, at her. Uh, I don't care. Well, I mean, I'm indifferent. <laughs> okay. You like it noisy, a little action, or you like it quiet? I like a little action. Okay. Okay. So s similar questions. 
So, what kind of restaurant do you like to go to? The most expensive restaurant. <laughs> All right. In Dallas. I'm going with you. All right. <laughs> you buy it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Maybe. <laughs> go ahead. Um, and um, so, what kind of food? Oh, it's got to be seafood. Like okay. some seafood. Surf and turf, probably. Okay. Yeah. And so, do you like, you know, is it the table? It's the most expensive. Oh, they my better gosh. have so expensive. It's like cloth napkins yeah. there. Golden. Okay. They better have like spoons. white towels at that point, exactly. too. Yeah, it's white tablecloth, everything. And do you, so do you prefer full bar? You don't care? Oh, full you bar. Like full has bar? to be. Yeah. And so, do you want like multiple courses, just one course? Oh, multiple okay. courses. And d- noisy, quiet? Uh, it could be noisy. It can be noisy. Yeah. So even in just your answers, there were some similarities mm-hmm. and there were some differences. Does it mean that your, Emma, your restaurant preference is better? No. No. And does it mean that Zorik, yours is worse? I mean, probably. <laughs> well, <laughs> worse on the pocketbook. So really when it comes to all questions pertaining to sex, there is no right or wrong. Right. There's just okay. preference. And your partner may have a different preference and that doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just different. Okay. Um, beautiful wow. Mary. Beautiful Mary. Thank S- you. So I would like to claim <laughs> that, but again, it wasn't it wasn't mine. I just thought it was a good idea, so I still. I yes. <laughs> so this was a funny question. Oh my goodness. Emma would love this question. Okay. Um. So is it normal to pass gas during an orgasm? <laughs> oh, that. Oh. How many people would we have to survey to find out if that's normal? I, I can't just believe <laughs> you did that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was just an excuse to use her. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because you are doing a podcast with a 14 year old boy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> God. So I guess to be determined, or we don't know yet. Uh, yeah, I Maybe don't you should run a, a study on that, <laughs> Zorik. Okay. I just cannot believe you just did that. Okay. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, my guess is depending on the type of sex you're having. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's possible. Make him awkward. Make him feel uncomfortable, wow. Mary. Wow. Areas are being manipulated. Um, yes, that, that is um, true. Perhaps a byproduct of that might be yeah. some gas. Okay. <laughs> are you feeling okay. comfortable right now? Uh, no, no, I'm okay. Um, so another thing here is um, orgasms. Yes, I'm for them. You are for them. <laughs> uh, do all women have them? Um, no. Mm-mm. Actually, no, there is, oh. a, and I, I can't remember the math, um, but there is a small, there's a percentage, not a small percentage, that's not fair. There is a percentage of women who have not experienced an orgasm. That's true. Oh, yes. okay. Mm-hmm. And that okay. can be, that can be a lot of reasons mm-hmm. why. So you can go like medical, you can go to like mental. So there's a lot of stuff happening. Right. Yeah. Do you get this question a lot? How do you, um, how, how do you spice up? the relationship through sex like what I can do. I do um I I do and I don't like <laughs> sometimes people like in a very roundabout way a very roundabout way um and l- it's such a hard question to answer because I don't know what that means to the person asking me right because I feel so like there's there's an idea that like if you have sex a certain way it's going to be fireworks right, right? like it's going to be like beautiful and and like harmonious and there's going to be an <laughs> orchestra playing and roses are going to fall down <laughs> and no well and like fireworks, fireworks. right yes. it's going to be yeah. crazy yes i think that um i mean there's so much uh, information about how to spice up your sex life so really when a client would ask me that i, I don't really, you know i don't really answer that question but I am curious about what is spicy for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I actually do have um, a worksheet where clients can answer um, things about things they might be willing to try, things they are never going to try. W- what is and it in the worksheet? Like positions or like um, different like actions? Different action, like, um, like maybe anal sex or toys mm-hmm. or um, handcuffs or, I mean, it's like there's right. a lot of, di- there's a list of different things. And actually for listeners, you can go on, you can Google um, a list you can find your own list if you want to ask mm-hmm. your partner um, but it's uh, it's really about what does that mean to a person because I think that answer just is so different for everybody and you know for some person having anal sex is no big deal they've been doing it since you know junior high no, right. I don't know but <laughs> another person that might be like whoa whoa yeah, yeah. like get away get yeah. away um, I, I got another question from somebody so let's say you're having sex with somebody let's say who uh, who um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. um, but while the 
person, the people are having sex, mm -hmm. they're saying, I love you. Mm -hmm. Should that person, I guess, take that to heart, the I love you? I think that's a beautiful segue to, that is, to, that uh, is. <laughs> to that the is. article. Nice. <laughs> um, I actually, I, so I'm curious what you guys think. I say I, don't I, take it to heart. I feel like when you're having sex, you're kind of in this world of emotions. Like mm -hmm. all of these things are happening. Mm -hmm. You're probably like having too many like senses overlord, uh, overload, right? And you're just kind of like on cloud nine. You're not really thinking. You're very mm -hmm. clouded in your judgment. And the things that are happening like just can't be taken to heart. I yeah I um, what and what's your what's your position what's your position on uh, this? sexual what <laughs> <laughs> so no what, what if someone says yeah. I love you what what in the middle say? of no. having sex um I I wouldn't believe it because um I'd probably in the moment believe it but then think back mm -hmm. and like think oh no maybe she, she probably didn't believe it because it was just in the moment and mm -hmm. dirty talk or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. so that's my position i would not believe it so i am um, and i know we're gonna talk about mm -hmm. some research related to this but Ooh. i'm so now i'm trying to make a decision should we talk about the research or because i do have a question no go ahead so i i guess my i'm curious of why why you wouldn't ask the person later what they meant Oh yeah. Ooh, yeah. Sorry. Ask. This is not my question, okay? Okay. <laughs> um, but, but but, I mean, I think it would be wor whenever we make assumptions. What's that? What's that cliche? Assumptions make an ass, ass out, out of, of you, you and me. me. <laughs> um, but I think um, assumptions can be tricky in relationships and get us into trouble. They, so. they well, they don't. They do get us into trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, before we really get started on this article, I kind of want to talk about the difference between like love and lust because they're the same, right? No. Oh, I thought they were the same thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so dumb? <laughs> I lust you, Emma. <laughs> In this moment. I I don't. <laughs> I don't. Neither of the L words right now. I'm feeling really left out. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love you, Mary. Um, oh. Proceed. All right. You know, so kind of want to hear from y'all. Like, obviously, Zorig thinks that they're the same things, but Mary, just, you know, mm -hmm. in our line of work, you know, what, what do you think the love and lust? I'm for it. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I think, um, so when we fall in love, there's a bunch of stuff happening. In yes. Our brain. And what we think, what we what we perceive as falling in love is that um, the the high, yeah. which is mm -hmm. um, involves a lot of activity in the brain and a lot of hormones and neurotransmitters and all this stuff happening. Right, because this is the phase when in re like in reality you're like you have the the rose colored glasses on, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing wrong with this person. So if I were to like fall in lust with Zorik, I would think that there's nothing wrong with him. When in reality, I can probably point out like all the things that are wrong with him. Thanks so a lot. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think I think lust lasts um, it's a shorter duration than love, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's like lo lust and then all of a sudden love happens. Mm -hmm. I don't think mm -hmm. it's that linear. Okay. That's the engineer in me. Well, yeah. I, so uh, I, and I know you're going to share more about the brain, um, but Esther Perel probably how many plugs i know right <laughs> esther can you be on our podcast please you've met me i am you know your best friends like ex-student <laughs> so um, it's about the difference between um to have which is love and to want which is desire Lo okay or lust you know mm -hmm. this to want i want this person mm -hmm. um and yeah so what'd you ask again <laughs> I don't remember I don't what he asked either. Ask <laughs> um, no, I was just saying that I, I feel like I feel like lust is in the in the beginning. Oh, it's like and okay. then love you build up love after that. 
it's kind of well if we're going kind of by her definition i think that there's different moments in the relationship when you can still lust your partner mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. even lust other people around you i mean i it, we're we're human beings so it, just because i'm in love and, and in a serious committed relationship with someone doesn't mean that i like i'm sorry like anytime magic mike or magic mike 2 comes on i'm gonna lust after channing tatum <laughs> so let's I'm say i'm gonna want to hit that let's say we're dating and we're sitting at a restaurant yep and my head just turns to the left here. Uh huh. And I'm looking at this person, very mm-hmm. nice person. The, a, oh, a woman. A woman, and I say I lust this person. Is that o- is that okay? In my book, it's okay. Yeah. Because I'm gonna be openly talking about like guys that I'm like lusting afterwards too. Well, so yeah. I, and I guess I would characterize it as a third thing, which is, I mean, I, I mean, uh, we're all human, and when we mm-hmm. see somebody attractive or sexually viable and appealing right um, we're probably gonna notice because yeah. we're yes. not dead so that's good news mm-hmm. <laughs> hooray <laughs> um but l- to me i guess I, I know we're using the word lust but i i usually use the word desire it's this desire to want i right. want this person mm-hmm. i want to be with them i want to see them i can't get enough of them i think about them all the time i can't stop thinking about them. i can't get any work done because all yeah. i'm doing is thinking about them blah, blah, blah. You know, and i that. think that can still happen like when you're kind of uh, i i Maybe sometimes we think that in the misconception of like when you're kind of in this relationship, like these things can't happen anymore. And I still I I, I disagree. And I think that you can yeah, you can okay. still like I desire do. your partner like, you know, you can still like have them go on a trip for business or whatever. Go or you go on a trip and all of a sudden you get back and mm-hmm. it's just like your teenagers all over again. You know, yeah. like yeah. that can still be a part of the relationship. But I think that we forget that. Or that um, because we are married, therefore we cannot do this. Sometimes, well, like that's kind of the rule. That that can be a rule. And in a long-term committed relationship, there's always this um, balance between um, autonomy and intimacy. Or mm-hmm. yeah, I guess autonomy. So explain. Like, um, autonomy is this: um, we're separate. We're we have our own desires and preferences about life. Our own friends, our you know, our, our work, um, all these things that make us unique and who we are. Our own interests, passions, whatever you want to call it, and our partner does too. And we pursue things that help satisfy and fulfill those, and they do too. And then we, in some ways, can kind of meet in the middle and have this closeness and. Um, this um, intimacy, this um, feeling connected and, and close to each other. It is really, 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 really <laughs> difficult to pull that off in a long-term relationship. And then you add kids, and it's super hard. Mm-hmm. So, um, And I think the thing that is so interesting about Esther's work is that what she's saying is that in modern relationship this is really the conundrum for people or the dilemma because in uh, in other um times in our human history this has not been an issue Mm -hmm. like people got married because you know you brought something to the marriage that was an advantage to the other family yeah Yeah, money or or you know well she can or you had land Mm -hmm. she can have several children and i need them to help on the farm you know it was a uh, marriage was about economy or economics and today we married for um, for love, and also we've inserted into that equation, in, in really the recent history, recent past, this idea that not only are we marrying for love, now are are we're marrying, and you sh- it should be a sexually satisfying relationship throughout the duration, and that's mm-hmm. that's just that's difficult. It's mm-hmm. very difficult. I'm not saying that it can't be achieved, but I'm saying it takes some attention work. Right. and yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. So, Emma, on that, Mm -hmm. what do we have in this article here? So, I got this from Psychology Today. That is correct. Yes. Okay. And the article is called The Surprisingly Similar Science of Sexual Desire and Love. Um, So, it's going to, we're just going to cover how the brain responds in similar ways to feelings of sexual desire and love, which is, you know, kind of what we, so we can say sexual desire or lust and love um, in this article. Um, And so, really, what it falls down to is that when we, feel love or sexual desire, it shows up um, in our brain the same way. So our brain is seeing both sexual desire and love 
in the same areas of the brain. Yeah, and Emma, I think I've spoken about this a lot, but whenever I get into a relationship or people get into relationships and have mm -hmm. sex, right, you get attached. Right. And maybe that's, it's this, it's this science, right? Mm hmm Yeah, that's, we get <laughs> attached. <laughs> Did you do that? Was that a zipper? No, what no. was that? That was, that was, that was a record. A, a record <laughs> oh my. But I think also whenever you are dating and you do hook up with somebody, it makes things even more confusing, right? Well, so attach, there's neurotransmitters involved in this process. Yes. <laughs> so, And by the way, neuro, uh, neuropsychology is not my gift, oh. but do it's okay. know this. That there's a, so the four main neurotransmitters are going to be dopamine, serotonin, estrogen, and testosterone. So Est we all have all of it. Yes, and but some of us are higher in a, a one of those or two of those neurotransmitters than others. Is it a female and male thing? Not necessarily. No, no, no. not always. Because okay. no. some there you'll find some men have mo is more estrogen than they do testosterone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for people that have higher levels of um, dopamine, they may experience more intense um, desire. Um, or, or a prefer like that kind of rush all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas people that are higher in maybe estrogen or serotonin may not need that rush all the time mm -hmm. in relationship. So it, I mean, it, it can, it depends. Boy, we say that a lot. It does, right? Cause <laughs> that, that's, I feel like that should be the motto of all therapists mm -hmm. and counselor. It just depends. So, um, okay, so I, so they did these fMRIs, which is a functional magnetic resonance imaging. So all I know is what they do is that they detect the increase of blood flow in different areas on the brain while you perform different tasks. And so what they did in this study is that participants looked at photographs or video of loved ones. And then in the studies that, so these were in the studies that assessed loved and the studies that assessed sexual desire, the participants viewed erotic stimuli, um, and then they recorded the blood flow in the brain. So um, what they found is, okay, so I'm going to explain little things to y'all real quick. So what they found is that the thalamus, hippocampus, and anterior cingulate cortex, thats those are big words, um, were active when p individuals felt love and desire. However, um, love and desire um, respond differently in, in sensation, but no, I'm sorry, I'm reading it wrong, but the brain does not respond exactly the same way to both sensations of love and desire. Um, so there's the interior portion of the insula that um, is associated with love, and the posterior portion was associated with desire. So there's parts that, like, the front part of your brain was more love, and the back side of your brain was more desire. But you're having the same, like, three regions in your brain being, um, being like, lit up by this So then it's, it's not really the same, then. It's different. It's, it's the, the same, like, It's the area, same area, but you see one or the other, and that's... So like general, mm -hmm. and then when you really get to specific, it's different. It's like United States, and then it's like Texas, and then like California, <laughs> and New York. But they're all sure. in the United States. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, the thalamus, just what it does, um, it just regulates consciousness, sleep, and alertness. I'm just gonna go through these really quickly. Um, the hippocampus, because it looks like a little horse, and that's how I remember it. Um, it's like a little seahorse. No. Okay. <laughs> it does look like a seahorse. So what it does, it just, <laughs> I hate shit. It, consoli it consolidates information from short-term memory to long-term memory. And then the cingulate cortex, um, what it does, um, it's just part of the limbic system. So it's part of your cerebral cortex. This is a lot of brain talk. Sorry, guys. Lots of brain talk. Well, I can have a diagram for you if you now. want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need some more wine. Go ahead. <laughs> So they, um, other studies also suggest that there's the same kind of neural similarities between sexual desire and love. And like Mary kind of talked about oxytocin earlier. Um, so oxytocin increases 
during sexual activity and orgasm for both so men and women. So when people were having sex, they had these brain patches on in their uh, like stuff on their heads, and mm -hmm. they were measuring that. No, they were they were looking at images. Yes. They weren't actually engaged in oh, sexual okay. activity. No, they're not they're not having sex and then being recorded. Yeah. But it says here and orgasm. So how do they simulate an orgasm? Right? So it says that oh, the neuropeptide oxytocin increases during sexual activity mm. and orgasm for both men and women. So maybe so maybe they were maybe having they were yeah. having. But and it, so, uh -huh. it was probably self Self-inflicted. Oh, yeah. I see. I see. <laughs> They're not. Yeah, you. That's that's a lot of lawsuits <laughs> waiting to happen right well, there. I mean, there is some research that does help people yeah. partnered sex, but okay. And so this oxytocin, kind of what you were saying earlier, Zorik, is associated with love and then pair bonding. Okay. So like you're bonding right. with your partner. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So I mean. Like we like we've spoken about this before, like, you know, kind of the, that that gray line of like, am I going to have sex with this person or am I not? Because you do kind of get attached to that person. Right. You kind of want more than that. Like, do I want to be with this person? We're compatible this way. And then if they don't call you, it's kind of like, what's wrong with this person? Like we had sex. Like, yeah, what's wrong with me? It's associated, like you said, with love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, it feels like you're getting closer to that person. I, I will mm -hmm. say, though, in working with clients they will express differences. So, um, I, I don't know that, that people will always associate the, f um, the first sexual encounter as, oh, this is, I'm in love with this person. I, so I, I think there are probably individual differences, um, that people have. I don't know. Have you, in your work, Emma, have you seen that? <laughs> <laughs> Your sexual work? You're looking work? at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, I'm trying to think. Like, n no, I don't remember. If I if I did, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I don't work in this field. You so. <laughs> no, you don't. But I have experience. I, I mean, it. I think oh my even gosh. if <laughs> listeners out there, are, you know, are sitting there with your friends chatting about this kind of stuff, I, my guess is that if you surveyed your friends, that you would have some friends that um, report that they can have a sexual encounter and not feel in love or loving, you know, like they're going right. to attach to that person and others who would say, no, I do. And, you know, so it was probably varies a little bit. Yeah. And so the other piece that I want to talk about too, or mention is that, um, the brain activated by both love and sexual desire are associated with the experience of reward. And so, you know, sex is rewarding. It can be rewarding to your brain. And I think that just kind of adds another layer of like, if people get attached, like you know, this is another, maybe your brain is the type of brain that's going to really associate this with reward. Like, I want more. I like this. Well, and, and thinking about the brain and experience, uh, I mean, we're kind of in an experimental phase in dating. So, um, you know, when you think about dating in terms of other things like ghosting or icing, see, I'm, I'm up on the Wait window. a second. What is icing? Icing, is that icing? new? It's when you put somebody, you know, you might get back to them every five or six days. Oh. Not, you know, oh. So I think that's what it is. Um, <laughs> that sounds, it sounds like they're putting um, it in the freezer. So who knows how <laughs> that's going to affect the brain's response right. during a sexual encounter because our brains are, you know, change. I am fascinated how the brain is going or how the brain is going to be affected by this technology of our younger kids. Mm -hmm. So like this younger generation, I, I am willing to bet that they are not going to have delayed gratification is they're going to want instant gratification constantly and the patience is going to be very thin mm -hmm. instant gratification so. it, like within with sex you mean no i it's just in life okay so it's kind of like so my oh, my example is anytime i go to the movies i have two friends whom i had to take the popcorn bucket away because I can delay my eating the popcorn in the movie until the movie starts. And I have two friends that like, if they have the bucket of popcorn in front of them, they will eat it. And they'll eat it until they're sick because they just can't stop because they just need it, need it, need it. And I can put the bucket away and not eat it. But why do you have to delay? <laughs> yeah, it's just I'm right like, there. Why can't you just eat it you know, before? Because I really want to eat it when I'm watching the movie. Like That is the point of me buying the popcorn. We can buy more if you run out. Nah. I'd rather just enjoy it as the movie progresses. Yeah. Yeah. I so gotcha. I See, believe I in like delayed gratification. I like to eat it before so I'm not distracted by the popcorn while I'm watching the movie. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, so Mary, what are your what are your main takeaways from this from this article that we just kind of talked about? Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. What are my main takeaways? Well, I mean, I think that I'm, it's interesting to see how the brain's affected in when oh, we yeah. are sexual. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, personally, I like for me and what I do. I, it's always good to have a f- um, some kind of foundation mm-hmm. for how you're working with a client. But at uh, at the end of the day, what really is relevant is what that client's experience is mm-hmm. and what what's going to be helpful for them. So um, research is good and important, and I'm glad we have it. But it's not always going to form exactly how I work with that client because I'm going to. Uh, Emma said earlier, meet them where they are and kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah. So for someone dating um, and having sex, like, do you have any recommendations or kind of things that people should kind of live by while they're dating? Yeah. I, I mean, one thing I would encourage people to do is to um, sort of ask themselves, like, what are their sexual values? Like, what is mm-hmm. it they want f- while they're dating? What is the um, value... Um, the values they want to take them to those experiences just so they're not putting themselves in positions where they may be doing things they they aren't comfortable like what's a value like for Um, example so some people might say um you know i only have sex after we've been on four dates i don't know making this up or some people say i'm i'm not going to be sexual until you know you're off your other dating apps oh like exclusive or something yeah so i think it i think that um answer varies but I, I think it's important for people to kind of have an understanding about what that is for them so that they're not putting themselves in a bad situation and then you know and then be comfortable if it changes so maybe mm-hmm. you thought you were the hookup girl and um, it was fine but then you're finding that perhaps your values change and you, it's not something you want to continue and so you sort of reassess and do the values change within like age or you know phase in their life? I don't think so no I don't like or not with my well, friends. Well, it's, it's, I see it more of like you're, like they're not, like you're going to have, like I said, you're going to have some kind of like core value and then you're always going to have some that like are going to change. And in different situations, like maybe you'll have one or two that stay the same, but let's say you have like top five values and then maybe you'll have like two or three that will kind of change in different parts of your life. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily age related. I would say it's experience related. So And I think during transitions too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think um you know, uh, when I work with clients that are just out of divorce um and who haven't maybe had new sexual partners in a long time, you know, it's kind of like, hey, this is great. There's apps and they'll come yeah. to my house. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, so they may be um uh, others might perceive that as sort of like a, a young adult behavior, but um, they're kind of experiencing themselves in a new way. So I don't know if it's age related, but we, with experience in our life, we do we do evaluate and adjust. And I think you're right; it's uh, it's related to probably different stages in our life or different mm-hmm. different um, transitions. Yeah. So cool. What did we learn from Mar- uh, from Mary Emma? Yeah. We learned. Yeah. What? We learned a lot. We learned values is we very learned about important. Values. And sh- there's like a, s- a six step verification process. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Yeah. I Doug miss you, Harvey. Doug. Yeah. And uh, and then it depends, right? It depends. It does depend. <laughs> it just depends. Well, I think what I, I guess what I'd want people to maybe think about is um, if you're asking the question, am I normal? So is everybody else. <laughs> Yes. So yeah. <laughs> Maybe that will help you answer the question. Well, there, then right. you're just saying there is no normal. Yeah, basically. there is no normal. Yeah. It's really preference based, and um, you know, if if you have some interesting preference, my guess is somebody else in this great state of Texas does too. And you can probably <laughs> find them yeah. with an yeah. app. Exactly. Yeah. 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 There's an app for that. Yeah. Yep. So where can we find you? How you can we find you? You can find me. Um, so I'm again. I'm a therapist at LifeWorks in both Dallas and Fort Worth, and you can look up our website at wefixbrains.com. That is an Wonderful. awesome domain. Isn't it? Yeah, yes, it's genius. Yes. Right? Okay. Or you I can email it. me directly at m miller, m as in Mary, <laughs> miller <laughs> um, at wefixbrains.com. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. 
Emma, yes. what, what do you have for this whole episode? What are your takeaways? Oh, man. This was this was a good one. I um I miss talking to Mary about sex. I do know that much. So, that's one of my takeaways. Yeah. You Zorik. I um I, I like that the six step, you know, process you talked about and kind of figuring out your values. I think that's something I'll try to figure out. Cool. Maybe we can all talk about it after oh this. Oh my gosh. I, <laughs> do you want me to get you some values cards? Yes. Do you want to have like a value card party? I need something to like take out whenever, you know, uh, just These a are reference. my Tom. I actually know someone who got recently engaged, and I joke you not, part of the ring was 12 diamonds to symbolize their 12 values. Wow. <laughs> Twelve. I don't believe in that's having twelve lot. values. Twelve but that's a lot. I mean, to each their how own, do you, right? How do you that how do you memorize that? Yeah. No, I have like three that I remember. <laughs> Wait, what's one? Tell Family. Us one. What? That's not very specific. Like you know, closeness to your family. Oh, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay. Are oh, you looking for the specific, like not the general? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm looking for uh, that one. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for thank joining you. us. Thank, thank you, you. for having me. It was fun. Yes. So, again, you can find Mary at wefixbrains.com. She works at LifeWorks at both the Dallas and Fort Worth office. If you do, have. Do you do remote, any like remote calls or I FaceTime or I something? Or? I don't. You don't? Okay. No. Oh, I'm just asking. We need to FaceTime you and ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. If you have any questions, comments, or topics that you want us to discuss, Send us an email at hello at datepodcast.com or you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at datepodcast. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>